Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, uh, good afternoon. My name is Andris Sprutz. I'm director of Latvian Institute of International Affairs. And today I have a great pleasure and honor to welcome the President of the Republic of Estonia, the Madam uh, Kersti Kaljulaid. Madam President, good afternoon and welcome to Riga. Good afternoon and very happy to be here, despite the difficult times. Absolutely. So it's challenging times, but thank you for willingness to share your insights. Uh, 100 years ago, Latvia and Estonia established diplomatic relations. And of course, we are and we were uh, good friends and colleagues and partners even before that. But sometimes our positions, approaches differ on some of the issues. How you would assess Latvia and Estonian relationship? Are they different from Finnish and Lithuanian relationship or direction from Estonian side? Yeah, indeed. Today is exactly the day when 100 years ago, the Jura, we recognized each other's republic. And of course, the relations were there before and have always been uh, good and warm. And uh, indeed, they are different as well. Because, I mean, one thing is to take a ship and go to another country or pass another country to reach a third mm -hmm. one. And then another thing is just to err into the other country. And uh, the times have been varied. I mean, before the uh, uh, regain, regaining of our independence, we crossed the border without noticing and, and since Schengen uh, well accepted us all, we have again been crossing the border without noticing it. Euro has given us a common money, which uh, again has, I believe, changed also this dynamics that people don't even notice where they are. And I believe uh, if we look at the numbers of uh, internal tourism between the two countries or, or the trade at the grassroots level, well, the difference is language. All, the, all else is pretty similar and, and same. And, uh, and this applies also, of course, for other neighbors. So it's not limited to Latvia, but also because of this uh, surrounding system of Euro and Schengen, it has been also enhancement for our bilateral cooperation. It is worth mentioning because very often people, when they are critical about our European Union, forget that. I mean, uh, without that, we wouldn't have neither Schengen nor Euro. Mm. And this is what makes us truly, truly unified. No, absolutely. And um, I think there is a lot of common, there is a lot of convergence. Uh, of course, there is also the project of Rail Baltica. Let's hope that this project will come true and uh, we will be able to travel even more intensively and communicate uh, between ourselves even more intensively and the friendship will be even strengthened. There are many more common big projects which are ongoing. For example, strengthening the electricity connections between Estonia and Latvia to make sure that the Baltic island can uh, independently operate if needed, which is a, a condition to join the Central European electricity grid. There is also the uh, wind, uh, offshore wind project uh, between Latvia and Estonia, which is one of the most advanced projects uh, seeking also the uh, connecting Europe uh, facility support from the next programming period. So Rail Baltic is, uh, is not the lonely uh, example. Mm. There are many other examples uh, where maybe unnoticed for a wider public our two countries are doing uh, big things together and I hope we'll continue to, to do so. Absolutely, and let's hope so. But Madam President, would you say that there are also some differences among us in terms of the policy approaches, in terms of the strategies, in terms of the dealing with our neighbors? How you would, how you would assess some of our divergences? Because we are still nation states with our own public societies, with our own leadership styles. So what are the differences? Yeah, this is the question you always hear also vis-a-vis -vis our Nordic neighbors, mm. etc. But let's, for example, take uh, Let's take security. Indeed, I mean, our tactical approaches might differ. I mean, you do not have a conscript army. We do. We are NATO members. Finns are only EOP, not members of NATO. But the important thing here is that our uh, analysis of the security situation in the region is exactly the same. So if our analysis is the same, then of course we are ready to take commonly the necessary steps to feel protected. Mm with these tactical differences, but the objective is the same, to contain the risk of our region. And I think this is one of the best examples to explain how, indeed, with tactical differences, strategically, we are exactly on the same page. I understand it's a little bit, uh, well, unusual to take 
exactly this where we seemingly have big differences in what we are doing <laughs> and say there is no big differences but this is truth and uh, this is I, I believe in most most issues we see exactly the same way commit to uh, discussions about what to do about Belarus, about mm, Ukraine mm, mm. we I believe we also both feel a strong moral obligation towards Eastern Partnership countries and also Lithuanian and Polish neighbours to feel this moral obligation to make sure they are not forgotten, to make sure that if they are evolving towards democracy, rule of law uh, and, uh, and free economic space that they also uh, get access to the European market and get more and more close relations to, to, these, uh, to these markets and, and also well, if they want to belong to our value sphere, that they are welcome to join our value sphere. We share our disappointments about what is currently happening in Georgia, for example, and mm. so on. So, uh, if you if you definitely wanted something which is uh, which which is different between our two countries, uh, then uh, I would say that I mean food is very different and the language is very different. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, for for all else, uh, I would say <laughs> there are so many similarities. I don't dwell very much on, on trying to find where I differ from, uh, from uh, Latvian friends. I don't. <laughs> Great, President. And of course, it means that fundamentally, strategically, we are absolutely on the same page. And it's natural that on some of the issues we might uh, diverge, and as you mentioned, tactically. I, I was surprised a bit about the food difference because uh, somehow for me the, the food is, uh, is, is quite similar. But we see we have different also the. I have the same perspectives on this. Language, of course, absolutely, but historically and in otherwise, I think culturally we've been very much connected. Uh, but President, Madam President, if we may continue with, I think, one of the challenging issues, of course, now we will live in times of the pandemic. Uh, and a year ago, all three Baltic countries established a bubble. We were even uh, shown and advertised as a sort of story of success. One year later, it's a bit more challenging how you would see this development, why the Baltic countries are facing those challenges? Well, you know, this Baltic bubble, uh, when it was created, uh, it was created out of the technical capabilities. I mean, they, we trusted each other's uh, statistics. Uh, statistics was also pretty good. And we could mm. see that without adding to the risk, we could, uh, we could freely commute between the three countries. So <laughs> we just did what we normally do in the Schengen space anyway. And if anything, I am astonished that the Schengen space has not been able to hold up better in, in this crisis. And even today, when uh, we know that, for example, the European Commission as well has advised against travel limitations as much as possible, we, we do have them uh, out of the necessity because our people and our governments have felt that they are, they are necessary. Uh, and indeed, it created us an, uh, a huge positive shift in, in image uh, because somewhere in the free Baltic states, people mm. had free movement. Mm. But I think it t tells more about the, uh, the desperate state of the Schengen area as a whole than, uh, than about the Baltic states as they were, because for us it was a simple technical decision. Uh, it reminded me very much about this when people talk about the Estonian uh, E and technological bubble. Everybody has a, a different opinion about what it is, why it was created, why we have achieved it. Uh, and, and mostly uh, in, their, in their mind, they have created something different from what we really do have. So it was a little bit similar moment. And despite, the, despite that, uh, I'm sad that we cannot do it right now. And I'm sorry that our people are limited in, uh, in traveling cross border. But uh, the situation with the virus in Estonia is bad, it's on the rise. Our, our uh, uh, top numbers are coming uh, and evolving later than in Latvia and Lithuania. Mm. This is just a matter of life. Whatever we do, however hard we work and try, pandemics is taking and running its own course to a certain extent. And we have to accept these facts, what, what are right now. Mm -hmm. Madam President, but if I still may ask you on, on the current situation, because of course we've been a success story previously, now certainly we're facing challenges and we are among the, the most challenged nations in, 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 in this regard. So something has been wrong with our governmental policies on this. Or it's been just that, of course, all countries face those second and third waves and it's pretty much unconnected with what governments decide. It's about a societal acceptance. 
Because some of the experts would say, look, I mean, also the most successful countries are those countries where the trust in government, the trust in leadership is the highest one. How do you assess this one? I think it's most a matter of enforcement. We have been considerably uh, less proactive on enforcement. We have relied on, uh, on the common sense of our people. And the problem, of course, is that the more and more time goes by, people get more and more tired. And you should, therefore, rely more and more on enforcement. Mm. And since we haven't done it, we are now seeing that since, I mean, there is quite a big part of population who doesn't change its behavior, even if they know they have been in close contact. Uh, then making stronger restrictions doesn't help in this sense that those people who have been abiding by the rules are still doing it and, and, and they, they do already live by the current rules and they will apply the future. But if you have a strong proportion of people who do not anyway apply any rules, then adding new rules is not helping. So what we are trying now to do is limiting open public space so that people just cannot gather that much. Uh, well, theatres are closed now, cinemas uh, from tomorrow, uh, museums even just for equal treatment, because actually I've never seen very dense uh, population of Estonian museums, I have to say. But just to treat uh, them equally, they're closed as well. But we also are realizing that uh, if uh, the restrictions alone are not helping, mm. then our uh, police and border guard forces are and, and have to get more proactive. Uh, and you, you didn't have this before in Estonia, which was common practice in uh, in old, old Europe already last year, that police calls and asks you to wave mm. from the window. Now we are doing it, not, not well big time, but it does happen. So people know that there is also somebody who is keeping an eye on whether they are really applying these uh, limitations. Previously, we limited uh, this kind of monitoring only to public spaces. Last spring, we only had, I mean, if people gathered on the beach, then uh, police sent a drone to tell them that you're not mm. supposed to do so. Now it's a little bit more personal, a little bit more kind of uh, uh, invasive, I would say. But we don't, we don't know how it will finally end. But on the other hand, I guess it's natural that we have valued personal freedoms mm. a little bit stronger. Because, I mean, we, lived, we still remember ourselves, most of us, how it was without personal freedoms. And the comparisons which we take are different from what is go happening in the Western Europe. So if we had been from the beginning so harsh with our people, this fatigue probably would have resulted in much more dissatisfaction and who knows which kind of uh, uh, problems we might be facing then. We know that other countries are facing well, big mass demonstrations and, and, uh, and people, people not happy with the mm. situation as well. So all in all, it's always a little bit also cultural, a little bit also political, who happens to form the government and be in the government, whether they are liberal or minded or more about we take decisions and, and care. It depends. Outcomes, to a certain extent, it's still the virus which decides, unfortunately. Mm, mm. No, President, absolutely. And I think you touched upon a number of important issues and one of them is the issue of personal freedoms, which I think we in the Baltic countries after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we highly value, it's one of the fundamental values, what we experience and what we enjoy and what we protect in many ways. But you also mentioned the word uh, enforcement and interference to some extent or in, 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 in invasion into the private uh, and, and personal freedoms. How you would assess what is the world uh, in democratic part of the world after a pandemic? Do you see any risks, do you see any challenges to this democratic way of lifestyle that actually digitalization uh, comes with some supervision mm -hmm. that uh, also personal freedoms might be somehow also more limited because exactly we experienced both. We, we experienced pandemic and we experienced also the more enforcement activities. Would you see that pandemic can create some challenges in the future in post-pandemic world for democracies? First of all, I strongly believe that digital technologies can be used in a way that it doesn't limit personal freedoms. There must be safe and secure rules on data gathering, data use and also disposal of the data. For example, Estonian government has promised its people that each and every time somebody looks at their data, we know, which is stronger data security than you have in the paper administration, where you don't see who reads your notes. I mean, if your doctor's office has your paper file, 
I don't know how many nurses have read it. If it's in digital format, I know how many nurses have read it. And I have the right to query why they read it. So digital technology actually protects my data. It does not make my data less safe in any format. This is first. Second, I do not believe that uh, people will say, OK, this was not so free world. It was not too bad. Let's continue living this way. I think there will be uh, well uh, a drive for freedoms. We know that freedom, situation of freedoms in many countries has been deteriorating gradually over the last decade. I think there would be a pushback by people. People will want more freedoms, I'm quite sure. It might, of course, in, uh, in a weird way, have the result that since in many people, in many countries, people believe this myth that technology automatically means big brother, which it doesn't. And I think it's for you in Latvia, for us in Estonia, for those people in Portugal, and in Finland and more and more also in Denmark who understand that this can be achieved uh, in a non-intrusive way, that we will finally prevail. But they expect a backlash in the trust indeed. As you worded your mm. question, this for me is a sign people are mixing weird things together. They shouldn't, you shouldn't as well. Second thing about freedoms in pandemics, this burden and lack, and I mean losing your freedom, was not equally distributed in societies. For example, people in old person's homes lost the right to be in contact with their relatives. We got advised not to visit. They were told you cannot be visited. People who are handicapped or special needs people in Estonia who live in society and work, they were told for their health reasons to stay inside, not to go out and work. They lost their jobs because of that. So you see, the burden was distributed this way that the weakest in the society lost more freedoms, suffered more. Mm -hmm. This was unfair. And I think we should not just say this is past now, let's live on. We should strive each and every day to make sure that the burden is equally distributed and does not come down on the weakest. Similarly, when we are discussing, for example, state support, the cost is fiscal deficits. We know all taxpayers will contribute later to pay back. Where do we spend this now? On the people or on maintaining the corporate structures and, and the ownership which we had before the pandemics by well, allowing the ownership not to change? Yeah, you can make the connection that the jobs are not lost and so on. But to a certain extent, I feel that we should put our emphasis on making sure that people are protected, not the ancient business models or even the ancient business ownerships. If the model is good, somebody else will come and be free from the burden of the pandemics. It may be sad, but this is how economy works. So we should always differentiate and see that if we are all contributing as taxpayers, mm. we should all also equally gain that the burden is equally shared in the population. President, absolutely. I think this solidarity is one of the key words in this regard, both how you contribute as an individual within society to the development of society and also how the state and the government also uh, supports and secures uh, the trust and basic uh, the lifestyle and welfare for the common people. Of course, it's extremely important, but I would still come back to this digitalization issue. Uh, I know that, of course, digitalization issue is an important and we don't have to immediately expect that it might lead to some kind of centralization or a dictatorship. But I, I would quote here the words of uh, uh, one of the thinkers, uh, uh, Noah Harari, who is actually saying that digitalization, digital world, somehow prefers dictatorship because data processing is more uh, centralized. Uh, how you, how I see, wrong he I can see, be. I see immediately that uh, you are... How uh, wrong he can be. <laughs> data, pro pro uh, data <laughs> processing in Estonian e-governance model is by design <laughs> not centralized. The only person who can gather my data in our fully digitalized administration is me. Nobody else can get all the files on me called together. It's my prerogative. I mean, if you are sitting in a paper administration and the civil servants will share the paper files, send copies, etc., nobody knows what data the government is gathering about people. In Estonia, if a police officer, because from the job viewpoint, 
he has access, let's say, to check whether I have my driver's license and whether my medical certificate is valid. They check it. There will be a footprint or a fingerprint in the system, a person, not that the Estonian police office, but this concrete officer looked at my data. I have the right to query. If it comes out, this person had nothing doing in checking whether my license is valid. I don't even drive, I'm a president. Then the state itself will prosecute these people. We had a funny case uh, this year. We have long had no problems. I mean, in the beginning, it still happened that, I mean, somebody checked on their ex-girlfriends, new boyfriends, I mean, a paycheck in the tax system. And, and they were taken to the court and, and people learned very quickly that you do not nose around in the system, even if technically because of your job, you can do it. You will still be held responsible. But we had a weird, uh, weird case uh, now last year where one doctor fell ill, was critically ill, and his colleagues all wanted to support him, to suggest something, I mean, what could be done better to provide him with the best possible care. And even when the doctor recovered, and even when he said that he absolutely mm -hmm. bears no grudge against his colleagues checking his data, I mean, measures were taken against these people. But the problem is that people think that paper is safe. How can it be safer? You don't know who read the papers. Whereas in digital files, if your legal space has been defined this way, you know. So it's not technology. It's the legal space which surrounds the technology by which the government takes the obligation to inform people if somebody has been looking at their data to have the right to query and, if necessary, to also prosecute those people who have nothing doing but nose around. And I don't have to do it myself, the state will do it, if I point out that, I mean, uh, there was no reason. So it's not technology, it's the legal environment. Mm. And indeed, I totally agree, if you are Josef Vissarionovich Stalin, <laughs> digital tools will help you to find people and find out with what they are dealing with. But if you are a democracy, then you will promise your people and create the legal space which will make sure that these things will not happen. And if they happen, then those who did things wrongly will also get punishment. So it is never about technology, it's always about society. And this is which people very often miss. Also on the positive side they miss. Very often I hear this during our United Nations Security Council campaign. Many people said, yes, we want this e-government because then the corruption will be gone because everything is transparent. Or, yes, we want this e-government because then we will have an efficient administrative system. And then you have to tell them that no, you can digitalize a mess and you will have a digitalized more efficient mess, but it will be a mess. You will not have lack of corruption in the, by, by, by the system design. It has to be societal, legal, cultural. So technology doesn't create problems and it doesn't resolve problems by itself. You can use mm. technology in a benign way by smart, uh, legal and also permissive environment. This is what Estonia does differently compared to many other countries. And this is what Harari and the others are not getting. <laughs> Madam President, I see you are very passionate about this and I think we could continue on those, I think, very fundamental, very important uh, issues to discuss because, uh, well, it's also they have a future. So when we move into that direction, I think those issues will be faced. It's not just about technicalities, it is about fundamental development of societies. Exactly. And I think, as you mentioned, there are, of course, a number of very important elements to this, but of course, how the system functions, how democratic values are being ingrained in the system. Yeah. And I think also what you underline, the, uh, leadership is impor important. Leadership also matters who is a leader. And in this regard, if I may lead you to the next uh, intellectual challenge, democracy is backsliding in Europe, at least in some parts of it. Uh, some leadership is becoming less democratic. How you would assess, would you agree with that one, that actually there are countries within like-minded community of democracies within the European Union, which are backsliding on democracy and democratic principles? Uh, I agree, and the solution is twofold. First is open discussion, 
Second is uh, analysis and action taken at the most political level. And uh, maybe the best example, and always it's best to remain in history if you want to give an example. In 2003, when, uh, when there were discussions about the uh, Austrian new government and mm -hmm. whether it fits into the European value system, it was the Council of Europe which took action. The other leaders who took action, because they are equal, because they could openly discuss it and, and, and they, could, they could also well, voice their opinion and it had a concrete result. When we started to see later in, in these developments, then uh, leaders were not willing in council to take responsibility. Uh, it was commission who was first left to deal with it. Meanwhile, we had also agreed on Lisbon Treaty. Lisbon Treaty took away political power from the commission. So we left the commission, which was far less political by design to deal with a highly political matter. And that's why we have this kind of long-term dis discussions about these developments. And of course, I'm not always happy with, with what I'm seeing. And indeed, it will finally, the outcome in each and every country depends on how free the media is. I mean, you cannot kind of silence a nation just like that. If the media freedom holds, people are ready and open to discuss the negative developments in the society, then you cannot silence a nation. Then you cannot make democracy to backslide. Because there are very often in many countries, I don't know whether you have in Latvia, but we do have in Estonia politicians who regularly say that uh, media should not uh, uh, treat them badly, but mm. it is. Mainstream media is totally as a, as a, as a system not useful, is, is not serving, uh, serving uh, their interests, therefore is not serving the national interests and all this. This is ongoing all the time. And you must be lucky to have leaders who are ready to stand up against this kind of developments. Mm. As you must have leaders who stand up against if somebody is bashing a certain group of the society. You must, you must be lucky to have this kind of leadership in every country, outsiders can be, play a supportive role, but leadership must be found always within a nation. It's a responsibility of each and every nation to remain a democratic, uh, free and value-based nation. Nobody from outside can finally, we can point out, others can point out, but the solution has to be from within. And there is no better way than guaranteeing the uh, proper good functional rule of law state, which guarantees free media, which guarantees independence also for civil servants, which gives the civil servants the possibility to refuse illegal, uh, illegal uh, uh, demand from the minister, for example, which gives the justice system independence, which means that police always feel safe to investigate corruption. Mm. All these things, if they function, and that's why you cannot say things are fine, never. You always have to go around and check that nothing is hurting this system of independent checks and balances. And if something is, and if you find yourself as a leader in such a position, you have to cry out loud. Yes, it will be bad for your own political future, no doubt about it. But what matters more? President, again, absolutely. So I think that uh, society is uh, determined pretty much how they develop and they are in charge. Um, they are the main stakeholders and owners of, let us say, societal developments. Uh, and um, of course, uh, at the same time, you can say that some outside influence, at least within community of like-minded, such as European Union, it can be helpful. How you see that debate which took place in the context of budgets that some of the countries, if they don't fulfill those democratic duties and they don't follow the democratic values or there is a risk of it, actually it is being connected also with some budgetary allocations? Well, it is difficult to, uh, to say because sooner or later this debate will end up uh, in the European Court of Justice. Uh, about mm. proportionality, for example. Was this measure proportionate? Was it directed the right way? And I think this is the best place to then finally debate it. But the important thing is that now we see that Council is taking the responsibility. If the Council has taken responsibility and has well decided that there is a good reason to, to cut, 
sooner or later we'll see these cases in the European Court of Justice, the best place to independ independently and according to the law to discuss this matter. I cannot predict what and how the court will decide, uh, but uh, I can predict that it will end up in court because now we have the tool by which the council can, I mean, decide and then of course the other side probably will take this issue to the Court of Justice and it is a good thing. I think there are lots of elements which uh, are not tried and tested and, and, and also some worrisome elements, particularly, I mean, what, what, what is the proportionality element here? We will see in the future. Mm. But for me, the important thing is that uh, the issues don't go under the radar and don't mm. go under mm. uh, without notice and don't get pushed on the technical, which means commission level, but are tackled by council heads on. Absolutely. Uh, Madam President, the last question would be about the uh, United Nations Security Council. Estonia has been uh, successful in, in uh, accessing the, the Security Council and becoming a non-permanent member of Security Council. Small countries will always advocate the rules-based order. Would you see that the uh, Security Council is one of the instruments where the small countries such as Estonia, such as Latvia, which are following example of Lithuania and Estonia, trying also to become uh, the non-permanent member of the Security Council, would you see that Security Council is a format where small countries can voice and can actually can influence the developments which they favor? In this case, exactly the rules-based order which, which we always advocate? I think it is possible, but you have to be resourceful, uh, ready to risk and, mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, also have something where you are trusted. Well, for us in Estonia, obviously, this is cyber and, uh, and uh, digital issues. I feel as an Estonian president, my moral obligation to make sure that country's sovereignty is protected in digital sphere because we are also promoting e-governance through UNDP, for example. Uh, there is a long-standing cooperation up to 20 years already, which was enlarged three years ago. And uh, we promote this kind of applications. Hence, we have to take responsibility in the Security Council to advance the international thinking that our legal space applies in cyberspace in a similar way like it does in analog space. There is plenty of academic analysis, including six working group at the UN level. There is the Tallinn manuals one and two, which deal with this. There are a few governments, and I'm very grateful for them that they have done it, who have declared their intent in case of a cyber conflict. This all is creating, I mean, this country's declaring is creating common, uh, common law in international space. Now, when we were running for the Security Council seat. Then I remember it was in Tallinn in the Human Rights uh, Conference where somebody very patronizingly told that small nations can only maybe tweak a little bit the agenda. And mm. I was like, come on, small nations have no time for small objectives. We want to radically shift the thinking of s on cyber, for example. And then, of course, when we were in the uh, Security Council first months, immediately there was a cyber attack against Georgia. First time ever. You would mm. think, I mean, it could have happened 10 years ago already. First time ever, somebody took the trouble to assemble enough support to have this as a, any other business discussion in Security Council. By this, we start creating common law that cyber elements can be discussed in United Nations Security Council. Attributions can be made. Countries' sovereignty can be attacked by cyber means. If we had sat meekly for the rest of the 24 months this achievement alone, for me, was worth the trouble. Because, as I said, we are Estonians, we have the moral obligation to protect sovereignty of the nations in the digital sphere. Just Madam one example. Madam President, but it's, I think, excellently said also that small countries don't have time for small objectives. That yeah. Actually, we should also look beyond those small objectives and, and think big. What would be your advice for Latvia uh, to become, how we should become, what would be the, the, the recipe for us to ensure that we are becoming also the members of the Security, Security Council? Do things differently. Do them in an innovative way. Find what is your strong point in this global world. Uh, give the other countries the opportunity to feel that they want to be as you are, similar to you, but never patronize just because you are bigger, you are richer. In the UN context, you are not a small nation and not a poor nation. Try to help to give other countries 
tools to, to I mean, advance their economic development or regional development and accept your limitations. I mm -hmm. had many discussions with, uh, for example, African leaders in the beginning of our campaign who said to me that but you should establish embassy in my country. And I said always, like, look, look Estonia can spend maybe 200,000 euros a year in Africa. Do you really want a couple of houses, a couple of cars and old-fashioned 20th century diplomacy? Or I spend all this money in Smart Africa, in memorandum of understanding between Estonia and African Union, and you, the leaders of African nations, be my ambassadors in these regions. I'll always talk to you, listen to you directly. Nowadays, communication happens so simply. Mm. Don't be, I mean, don't fall into this trap of old hierarchies, you know, where the uh, these uh, holders of different tables in different ministries of foreign affairs, you know, move from lower levels to upper levels and then, I mean, finally the leaders discuss and everybody knows the questions and the answers. Have a lively debate with the whole world. That's my advice to you. Do it the 21st century way, direct context, uh, lively debate, always being helpful to other nations. This is how to get to the Security Council if you are a small country with not so many resources. Madam President, think big, think differently, think creatively, remember about democratic values. Uh, so thank you so much. It, would, it, it was a pleasure and I would be happy to continue our debate. I hope that next time you come we continue our debate. But this time, of course, I once more express my appreciation and I wish you a very successful rest of the visit. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you and I would there. also like to express my condolences to the close ones of those people who have lost their lives in the pandemic in Latvia. Thank you, President. Thank you.